Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this webinar. Can you hear me? Are we transmitting? I assume we are. Uh, we've had one or two technical difficulties this morning. I'll hope you bear with us if we have any problems, but we'll carry on now. Um, the, you've seen the agenda which we will go through this morning. Uh, I'll talk to you briefly about the code of practice, traction engine and the law, and then we'll have some updates on coal, boiler inspections, insurance, best, the SAC, and we'll finally have our chairman, Rob, to talk about the trust. So if we move on then, um, and if you have any questions during the webinar, you can use the question and answer facility. And if we don't actually answer them during the webinar, we will publish the questions and the answers uh, as soon as possible on the website. So moving on then to the engine owner's code of practice. Um, we're about to check the code for necessary updates. And if there are any suggestions that people are unsure about or would like clarifying, please email me at engines at ntet.co.uk. I have already had some suggestions uh, and we will reincorporate those when we update it. Regarding traction engines and the law, We've now updated it. Um, we're grateful thanks to Dr. Raymond Rowe and John Hawkes, and we intend to publish it shortly. So that's really all I want to say about those at the moment and pass you now, pass you on to David Smith, who will talk to you about coal. David. David, are you there? Right. Thank you, Nick. Um, <laughs> good morning, everybody. Uh, as Mob said, we've had a few gremlins this morning and we're all in a little bit of an edgy state, including myself. So let's cut to the quick. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the coal situation in some detail and uh, along with me will be uh, Tom Atwood, who many of you might know. Uh, Tom's joined my TSU team and brought the strength of his uh, engineering and scientific expertise into play and we'll hear a bit about it from Tom as we go along. So what have we been doing? Um, <clears throat> is one of the topics we've got, we're going to discuss. We're going to look at the current situation. Where are we now? We're going to look at the future and the option of forming partnerships with other people. Other people. Uh, we have got one potential partner who's very close, come very close to it, and they have a point of view, which I'm going to share with you. We're going to look at our options, uh, and we'll, then we'll be summarising the situation as we see it. Uh, and then Tom's going to talk to us uh, about trials uh, that we're undertaking. So what are we doing? Well, we're looking for reliable and suitable sources of fuel. We really are. We've been doing this for a while. It's become rather intense, of course, because we've lost fossil fun. A little bit more about that later. Uh, <clears throat> we're moving at a pace that we hadn't anticipated at this particular time, I have to say. We're talking to suppliers and potential partners. We're looking at um, what our options are, basically. That, that's, that's what we're trying to establish. 
We're developing, we're helping define the specification for new and alternative fuels for road steam use. Because um, our love affair with coal per se uh, is coming to an end. Uh, we must not deny that. It's not coming an end tomorrow, but it is coming to an end. And we've got to start that journey that says, what should we do else other than putting things on the plinth and making them look shiny? Well, we're not ever going to do that. We're trialing. We're looking at what's available today and new material that's available today. Tom's going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about that. But this is an all comers. This is not just focusing on what NTT members uh, are telling us. It's anybody who's got an interest in our future as a, as an, as a fraternity. We're inviting them to get involved and, and let us know how you're working with particular fuels and, and in particular the new fuels that might be coming along. And we're lobbying. We're always lobbying. We've got, we're members, as you know, of the Heritage Fuels Association. <clears throat> but quite recently, the National Transport Trust has called a meeting of all organisations in heritage that are mobile. So that's, it doesn't matter what fuel you're burning, it's all organisations that have got a mobile element. So we're talking about aeroplanes, we're talking about cars, we're talking about traction engines and boats, uh, canal boats, uh, anything that moves. It doesn't matter how it moves. And the NTT's boast is that, and quite rightly, it's the only organisation that has got an interest in all of transportation. And they're calling together a meeting of people like ourselves, organisations like ourselves, to discuss the way forward uh, of the against all of the challenges that are affecting the mobile heritage groups and more of that later on. So the current situation, working backwards 10 years ago, 15 million tons of coal was mined in the UK. This is not me crying in my beer. This is just the walk to where we are. And five years ago, this had dropped to a, a 1 million tons. You can see it was plummeting down. Today, we're seeing the last of a few thousand tons of coal coming from the likes of Fossey Farm whilst they're still permitted to mine. And by the end of 2022, there will be only one mine left in the UK, and that will be mining anthracite, not bituminous coal, of a pergram. Uh, and that itself is the centre of some anxiety in certain quarters, because it's just been given a granted an extension to its licence. In the face of the green lobby, that's not gone down well. But if we don't get that coal, then we haven't got a steel industry. It's very, very, very simple. Very simple. The current position is that the coal supply in the UK is tight. Some of you are already experiencing that. But there is coal available. But it might not be in the form that you're used to. So moving forward, there's an uncertainty as, <clears throat> as we move through the season about availability and price and quality. And all of this is made horrendously worse by the herald conflict that's taking place in the Ukraine. And in, that is a, a most sad situation, which we've got no influence over as we, we're here, but it will have a bearing on what we're doing. And we can't forget that. We're trying to run forward looking for alternate supplies, but it, it will inevitably impact on almost everything we're going to do. Fossey Fan. There is no extension to its license terms. And despite what we're hearing from um, people who are doing a lot of wishful thinking, it isn't going to happen. There are issues. There's a great big hole in the ground that wants filling up. Uh, and it's part of the deal at Fossey Farm that they should have a fund that fills that hole. Well, that fuel, that fund is minus an eye-watering amount of money. But even that concept of leaving the hole to somebody else to fill hasn't uh, budged the Welsh Assembly, I'm afraid. So it's set to close in October 2022. We might see it running with, with fetching the scalpings out until November, but it doesn't affect us. So all, all output from Fossey Fan 
since about seven or eight weeks ago has been crushed and he's been used at Tata Steel. And I learned only last week, middle of this immediate previous week, that the owners of, of uh, Fossey Fund really aren't interested in getting any ideas of, of sending lump coal elsewhere for grading. They, they just want out of it. There's nothing in any of these issues that brings them any more money. Uh, and they're, they're just, they know that they're coming to a, a conclusion in October and th there's no impetus. There's no final financial impetus in them to support grading of lump fuel, I'm afraid. It's as simple as that. So the likelihood of lump coal being resumed, in my humble opinion, is zero, absolutely zero. So I'm going to say to you, rest in peace, Fossey Farm. Tuvithic Wells Steam Ovoids has appeared. Uh, <clears throat> they came onto the market in February, middle February, a bit of a rush. It was explained to us that, the, the, <clears throat> again, because of the closure of Fossey Fan, or not the closure, the, the loss of lump coal, this was brought to market ahead of its uh, launch date. It was untried, really. Uh, it's now been uh, picked up by lots of people. Uh, it was tried on, trialled on railways. I've spoken to the people who, um, <coughs> who have used it. And we'll, Tom will probably tell you a little bit more that there, there are now traction engines using it. But I have to tell you, because it's a pure anthracitic coal, it is not for the rookie user. It has to be used in a particular way. You have to relearn and possibly you're going to have to blend it quite seriously with another fuel to give it the incentive to burn. It will, it will not spring to light of its own allow, uh, on, on its own account and it won't stay alight unless you've got a good draft. Now, this is not me poo-pooing the, 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 the product itself. You simply got to learn to use it in a very, very, very different way. <clears throat> experiences to date vary and, and again I've mentioned over and over uh, we'll get some feedback hopefully with coal trials quite recently John Flynn did an epic journey uh, on his engine across uh, southern England and to Paul in Dorset and he wrote a, a, a really good report in traction on traction talk about his endeavors and and he shared that with us and we're very grateful to John for that it makes very, very interesting reading, but it does show that the material can be worked with. That's important. Moving on then, stocks on the ground. <clears throat> there are still very limited stocks of Scottish coal, Shotton in particular, mainly at coal merchants, but it's going quickly. And my message is if you want that coal, then get to your coal merchant and get it bought. Uh, I talk often about what I call the toilet roll syndrome, I'm being very selfish when I say to you, go and buy the coal if it's there. Get it if you can. Simple. Colombian coal is available in this country. <clears throat> some, of, some of you may have used it. Uh, I'm told, well, I know that it's expensive. Even the coal merchant uh, tells us that they call it the rich man's coal. Uh, it's predominantly here for domestic burn, but it will raise steam. But one of our friends said to us not so very long ago, it's like feeding strawberries to a donkey. The fire hall door was never shut. Uh, it's not economical in certain areas of use. We do know that there's substantial stock of Russian coal oh, at Hayes Fuels in Belfast. I've spoken with Alistair Hayes uh, and he's quite prepared to ship 29 tonnes at a time to any destination into the UK. If you want any less than that, you'll have to ship it at your own expense, but he is prepared to ship it in small sizes if you want to. So that leads me to talk to you possibly about groups forming at this point in time, some sort of consortia cooperative. I know that Klondike have done that in the past and maybe others might be thinking of doing a similar thing. However, I didn't realize that was bouncing. Uh, there are substantial stocks of manufactured ovoids available to us, which are used by the domestic market. Now, this is not traditional coal, but it's there, it's being burnt, and it is usable. And I would urge you, uh, particularly those with smaller fireboxes, uh, to have a, don't discount this fuel. 
it's perfectly serviceable uh, and again you might have to mix it if you've got a larger engine but don't discount it i'm suggesting so what have we got <clears throat> we've got a reducing number of companies importing and prepping and distributing coal the demand for coal is falling and the heritage fraternity is coming into focus because it is one of the few users that will require coal in its original form. We know that and we just need to remind ourselves of it. We're talking with an Australian supplier, would you believe, <clears throat> who made themselves known to us and have made some very interesting propositions. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. And we're exploring those and we've passed those details on to one of the suppliers that we've gotten quite close to as well. Uh, so there's, there is some hope, but it's got to travel a long way. That's the problem. It's quite burnable. It sounds very interesting. It's got a very good specification, but it's coming from a long way and all that goes with that. <clears throat> we've been talking to several large organizations bringing coal into the country. In particular, we've been talking to CPL, Coal Products Limited as have the railways, by the way. Um, they're the UK's largest manufacturer of smokeless fuels. So they know a little bit about what's going on. They're innovative. They're quite prepared to create new fuels. In fact, they're doing so already. We've, we've heard about their E50 product, which didn't suit traction engines very well, but more of that later. They can vary the composition of their fuels almost at will and they've offered to the NTET specifically to the NTET that they will give us trial loads to help create a traction engine fuel now I want to be clear here they're offering it to the NTET as the coordinator of the trials that doesn't mean the NTET is only going to give it out to its members let's be fair about this this problem is everybody's problem and the NTT is here to try and help everybody and I hope that its members will support that attitude. So we've got the prospect of some fairly substantial trials of, of coal um, and there are three particular calls that are being offered to us and what we're going to ask you to do is to contact Tom Atwood and he'll tell you a little bit about this later on uh, and show your interest. And we don't want loads and loads of the same engine, types of engine, obviously. We want to get a cross section. So we're going to put all of the um, offers of help into different hats, re re reflecting the types of engine. And we're going to pull names out of the hats to see where we're going to ask the CPL to dispatch those calls to, uh, those fuels to. So if you want to participate, then listen carefully to Tom a little bit later on. So I've talked about forming partnerships and already I've let the cat out the bag. We are talking very closely to CPL. We met with them, John Durling and myself met with them on Tuesday this last week. And in my mind's eye, we had a, an hour's conversation. Well, three and a half hours later, we were finding it difficult to wrap up, quite frankly. It was a very, very, very interesting meeting, very much indeed. So that's, let's have a look what we've got. Let's tell you a little bit about CPL. British, they're a British manufacturing business and they tell us their heritage stretches back 300 years. I'm not quite sure where they get that from. It's because they were formed out of the National Coal Board predominantly that they might be claiming that, but that's by the by. They employ 650 people, and they turn over 160 million pounds. They've got three manufacturing plants in the UK and Ireland, capable of producing 500, <coughs> 1,000 tonnes of smokeless fuel per annum. And they're the largest smokeless fuel manufacturer in Europe. Quite a decent pedigree. One of the UK's largest importers of coal and anthracite in excess of 250,000 tonnes per annum with a two million pound state of the art Parnaby cyclone washing plant at Immingdon. <clears throat> They've got a network of 28 depots offering nationwide delivery from a single bag to hundreds of tons. 
Now, this is important to us because very early on when we started this journey, we were trying to work out the NTT was never in the business of buying in lots of coal and was organizing its dis disbursement. Why not talk with people who are already doing it, who already know what the game is? And so that was, that's what has attracted us to CPL. And there are other reasons I'll have to explain. They're the only solid fuel manufacturer capable of producing smokeless solid fuels containing biomass. We've worked with their product E50. We know that it works in certain areas. It doesn't work very well for traction engines more of that later but they've they, that's where they've got the idea of changing the blends so how can cpl help the heritage sector this is their this is their offer to us we're committed to working with the heritage sector to find a suitable fuel or fuels to future proof the sector this is really important our main aims are as follows produce a fuel to replace coal currently used, which mimics the performance as closely as possible. Make it as kind to the environment as possible. Go from smoky to smokeless, from bituminous to biomass. That's the long journey. Make it, make it future-proof. All the ingredients must be widely available and the end product must adhere to all environmental legislation. I think we've got to bow to that we're special in our own minds, but we will become the only people burning smoky type fuels and will attract attention. And we don't want that attention. Make it easy to purchase. UK manufactured widely available, regardless of quantity required. From one bag, 25 kilo bag to hundreds of tons. So let's summarize. We're committed. This is CPL. We are committed to help develop future fuels with the NTET. CPL has the manufacturing, distribution and <clears throat> research and development capabilities to cater for the heritage sector fuel requirements. We know that coal availability is currently tight. And pricing is increasing and is set to increase even, even further. There is talk that eventually the bubble will burst, but nobody will tell you when. The reason it's emphasised that it will burst is because people buying as much fuel, even though it might be available because they don't want to be caught on the hop when at the end of a six week journey, the coal may have halved its value. So they're not buying as much. They're not speculating to that extent. And that's causing a depression in the amount of fuel that's available to us. So the uncertainty remains on supply for the second half of the summer. So I'm going to return what I said earlier. If you need it, buy it now. And smokeless ovoids offer an immediate and affordable solution. So at this point, Tom, I hope you're ready. I'm going to hand over to Tom for him to explain what he's been working with. All yours, Tom. Okay, thanks very much, Dave. Um, so, so I think uh, I'm right in saying Dave is going to continue with the presentation. So I'm going to do my best um, government impression by saying next slide, please, as we work through this. So, so just bear with me a little bit. Um, and I think it's probably quite important. I'll just give a very quick um, sort of introduction to myself um, for a couple of reasons. I, I can't see the audience, so I don't know how many people out there I already know. Um, and I am very new to the NTET. Um, so just to, just to give a very quick snapshot. Um, I'm, I'm not a full-size traction engine owner, but I've been involved with the hobby um, since I was about nine and have been a, or started as a steam apprentice for James Harvey Bathurst at Eastnall Castle, who of course has been working with Dave Smith very closely on the uh, Heritage Fuel Alliance. So I've, I've been a side watcher of, of this activity for the last couple of years. And I have to admit, um, I sat in on the Coming Clean About Coal um, webinar approximately a year ago. And, and basically felt enthused that really I shouldn't just sit there watching other people do all the hard work. It's about time I threw my threw my hat into the ring 
um, and saw if there was anything that I could offer. So, so that's been my motivation for joining the NTE team and, um, and being welcomed into the TSU team with Dave Smith to work on this. So I, I have to say it's, it's a pleasure to, to be involved. And um, I'm hoping my efforts will actually help us all get to a, a sort of comfortable position, particularly seen as the challenges around coal are, are definitely mounting and feel very, very real at the moment. OK, so that, that's, that's it about me. Uh, we'll get into the exciting bit more about the trials. So uh, next slide, please, Dave. OK, so before before I get into to working through the, the content on the slide here, I also just want to make a, a couple of points. I, I refer to the road steam application um, throughout these slides. Um, please do not think that is excluding anyone who has a portable or a stationary engine or any other um, sort of variant of a steam engine that's included within, within our banner. Um, it's just a term to capture all of those. So, so please, please don't feel uh, like you're being left out. You absolutely are not. Um, and I think it's very important. I think Dave has done an excellent job already of stressing the fact that this is bigger than the NTET. So although we are doing this act, these activities under the banner of the NTET, it is absolutely open to everyone who has a vested interest in road steam engines. Um, and, and that I tried to, to labour all the way through. So please take that message away. Um, that's very important. OK, so specifically into the coal trials, the purpose of running these is to allow everyone to participate in sharing their experiences and conclusions of the fuels that they are using of all types. So that's the coal and ovoids that are now on the market um, and making it a comparable tool. So something that we can look at the, the different coals and the different ovoid types and be able to see how they behave against each other and in different steam applications. And this is particularly important in light of the fact that we are seeing the diminishing supply of our established coals of choice um, very much on an accelerated scale now. OK, next slide then, please, Dave. So the objective, the purpose of doing this is to help owners, operators and event organisers make the best informed choices on what coals and overall types of fuel are available for their application. And this, the important factor here is this information is being gathered from road steam. Um, so I'm sure you're all aware that the railways have been running similar activities for approximately the last 12 months. Um, whilst we are similar, obviously, we are equally very different in many ways. The, the diversity of road steam um, applications is greater than the railways. Uh, and, and even within their own sector, they're beginning to see the, the difference between sort of smaller gauges and larger gauges. So it, it's become very apparent it is important for us to conduct these trials within the road steam application and not purely rely on the information coming from the railways on its own. You know, it needs to be supported by our own. OK, next next slide then. But so I think Dave, Dave has uh, summarised this pretty well. There are some immediate challenges and a lot of this coal trials work is now more reactionary than perhaps I, I hoped it would be. Um, based on the sort of ever developing situation around us, you know, established coal supplies, um, some of which we, we certainly didn't foresee pausing or stopping or, or being under threat to the heritage sector as soon as they now have been. Um, so I, I am, I guess, giving myself a little bit of slack here to say this is a working development and on an accelerated timeline to what we hoped. Um, so bear with us, <clears throat> excuse me, bear with us as, as we work through this. Um, but really that stresses the importance of all of us sharing the information that we receive, you know, from, from the trials that we do with various fuel types, particularly as our favoured coals perhaps start to dry up and, and disappear from the supply chain. Okay, next slide then. <laughs> so getting into the nitty gritty of what we're actually doing. So the coal trials are going to be split into three activities. And as I say, where possible, we'll run these in conjunction with each other. The, the purpose of doing that, um, whilst it perhaps isn't the easiest and tidiest way to do things, is so we get an answer or get some conclusions as quickly as possible um, for, for all the reasons that have been discussed previously. Uh, however, there is a bit of a caveat to that. I am anticipating that this activity to be done to its full extent is going to take the majority of 2022. Um, I, I would sort of put a plea out to people. The more that you engage and support these activities, though, the likelihood is we'll get some conclusions sooner, which we can share with everyone. And that is fundamentally the purpose of doing this, is to share the data and help everyone make informed choices. OK, next slide. So just to, just to show this visually for, for people who are watching on the screen, and, and obviously I'll talk through it for, for those who are perhaps uh, cleaning their engines or doing something more interesting whilst listening. Um, this is how I am planning the activities out. So the, the first one is a, is a diary sheet, which I've already launched. Um, 
hopefully some of you have seen those we've had a good response bearing in mind we launched this in february so so not the height of the season by any stretch um so thank you very much for people who've responded and and we are steadily getting more and more responses to that um the second one as dave has touched upon in, in some detail already is the e-coal trials uh, which are in conjunction with cpl they are just at the, the cusp of beginning and at the beginning of that activity and i wish to discuss that a bit further and then the third one, which will happen sometime later in the year, will most likely be some back-to-back -back trials based on um, the experiences and data that we gather from the diary sheets and the e-coal um, information. So, so the idea of the back-to-back -back trials is to try and um, contr control some of the variables that might exist by, by uh, engine type and engine driver and you know, the situation in which they're applied and purely compare the fuel type as best as possible. Um, but that is very much a work in progress. So, uh, so we'll talk about that separately. Okay, next next slide. So the, the one, I'm, I'm rightly or wrongly, I'm very proud of the fact that uh, that we've launched this already. Um, so it, it launched back in, in mid-February, as I mentioned. And, and I'm referring to this as the anecdotal coal trials diary sheets. So this is open to everyone. And the purpose of this is to gather feedback and experiences that we can share with everyone. So, so if you are trialing a new fuel to yourself, or even if you're using an old established fuel, um, it's really helpful if you provide the information back to us on the on the provided diary sheets and with the supporting questionnaire. The reason for that is it helps capture those individual experiences, but in a way that we can compare the fuel types and the behaviour of those fuels with each other. And the, the, the purpose really at the end of this is to be able to present that data to everyone in a way that's easy to understand. So, so as an as a operator or as an event organiser, hopefully you'll be able to review that data and make a good informed choice over the fuel, fuel type that works best for the application that you wish to use it in or the event type that you are running. But I think that's going to be really key. And you know that, that there is unlikely to be a one size fits all solution. I, I can't say that for a fact, but that is my feeling. I think we've been incredibly lucky and spoiled that the majority of people have used uh, Fossi Fran with great effect and, and been confident with that for many years. Um, I hesitate to say whether there will be a single single fuel source that will suit us all quite as well as Fossi Fran has. Obviously, I say that with a caveat because I know there's people out there who, who were never keen on it in the first place. But as a general rule of thumb, it has been a pretty good one size fits all. So we have to be prepared that that may not be the way things look in the future. OK, I've waffled slightly there, so just getting back on track. Um, this is open to anyone, any road steam user. OK, so that's, that's really important. Mem member or non-member, any country, any location, I'm really interested to hear it because it's the solutions to our problems are going to come from multiple sources. I'm quite sure of that. Um, the purpose of this data, as I mentioned, is for it to be shared with anyone. This is a pretty easy and, dare I say, free or cheap activity for us to conduct. So, so it's really important that we try and make the most of it as quickly as we can. And to put that into a time scale, we launched in mid-February. My intention is that we run this data or data gather for the next six months. And at key points as the data comes in, I'll make sure that's shared back out. So it won't be a case of just waiting for six months for the data to, to be available, um, because I think many of us are probably wanting some of this information to make some choices uh, i am in my mind i'm anticipating that we'll have data out within three months however if key things come to light um so dave touched upon the trithivic ovoids earlier as as we receive feedback on that i will do my best to share the common themes and the conclusions that people are finding of the particular field types if i think they're helpful um to everyone in the short term and, and we have done that with the ovoids um for anyone who hasn't seen that that notification and they've touched upon it in, in terms of its anthracitic bases uh, it needs help in, in getting a light it, it provides excellent heat when it's hot um, but it needs that assistance in getting there so from from some of the feedback we've had already people are blending it with other fuels that are easier to combust and, and that is certainly then helping spread spread the life of that fuel if it's a coal so it'll last that bit longer um, and also giving good heat and, and clean emissions so so there's pros and cons on both sides um, so I think that's that, that's really important just, just to, to make that point. There is a summary of that available on the NTT website. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. And, and I think I've probably talked talk through the majority of this already, but just to make it very clear, how this works for you as an end user is, is any, anyone can use it, and we ask you to submit a diary sheet. Um, they are available online, and I'll show you the link for that later. 
it records some specific engine details, so the type of engine that you're using, the type of steam activity that you're undertaking, and the fuel that you're using. Obviously, they're, they're key factors. The questionnaire section is particularly focused on the fuel and its behavior. So that, that's the crux of the purpose of running this. There is also an open comment section, um, and that's, that's proving really valuable from the feedback we've had already. Uh, lots of good information and suggestions from, from operators are coming from that, and we'll do our best to share that as it comes through. And then it's really easy. You can either email it back. The form can be filled in online uh, on, on, on a live document and emailed um, to the address I'll show you later, or you can post it if that's your preferred option. Okay, and then the next slide goes into that, just shows, shows these things. Oh, no. So just, just, just to be clear, sorry, I've got that wrong, but um, just to be clear, the, the purpose of gathering this information is so that we can share those experiences and conclusions of the fuel types as best as possible and allow people to compare the different fuel types. Um, as I have said, the data will be available for everyone. Um, and obviously, the more people who help with this activity, the more accurate and representative it will be. This will also guide our back-to-back -back trials later on. Okay, next slide then, Dave. So this, this shows the form, which was the one I thought was coming up next, so apologies for that. Um, as I say, it is available online. The website is, is shown at the top there. It's from the NTT website, as you would expect. Um, the form is just a one side of A4. We've tried to keep it as simple as possible. Um, and obviously, I do welcome feedback if you think we've missed something key that we should be uh, measuring or asking for in there. Please let me know. Um, you know, this, this is for all of us to help get to a decent answer or get some answers from. Uh, and just, just another another plea, just to say it is live now. So as soon as you're in a position to start using your engine and you have some fuel available, then, then please consider filling in one of these forms. Um, it, it's there for the benefit of everyone. Okay, so moving on to the next activity. And this is the one that's probably uh, going to be the most interesting, dare I say, for the time being, um, and, and probably the one that's got a lot of um, skepticism around it I, and I think that's probably you know fair in many respects so this is the e-cold development trials I think it's absolutely fantastic that CPL are keen to work with us to develop an alternative to the bituminous coal option um, in my mind this was something I, I saw unfolding over the next three to five years um, obviously the time scales on all of this are being pushed quite heavily at the moment um, so, uh, so I think we should all be very grateful, at least, that CPL are very keen to work with us and work with the road steam application to try and develop something. And I do use the word try. It is a trial and a development process, so it, it's going to be working progress. The sooner we start this, though, the sooner we'll get to a point of knowing whether an e-coal really can be developed that works in road steam. And I have to say, as, as we are going through some of the talks with CPL, I'm growing in confidence. So, so I sat dare I say it, as a bit of a, a sceptic on this, um, I am more open-minded, and that's my plea to everyone, just be open-minded to it and give the feedback via the cold diary sheets as, as you might trial e-coal and, and other biofuels. Um, the more data we get, the sooner we get it, the, the easier and better it is for us to feed this into the manufacturers to try and develop a better fuel. So the key thing to take from this is we are launching right now. It's, it's effectively going, going live as I speak. And, and we are doing that through inviting participants to take place. So Dave, Dave touched upon that, and I wish to expand on that a little bit more. Obviously, this is a relatively complex thing to go through, and there are costs involved. Um, thankfully, I, uh, the developers will, will foot the majority of that, but, but we do need to be mindful that it is an experimental and developmental process. Okay, next slide then, Dave. So the, the manufacturer is keen to work with us to develop the fuel. I think, I think that's been well stressed already. Um, we require some participants to conduct trials with their um, with the current product that's available from the e-coal provider, and they have already brought out a revised version of that um, based on some early days feedback. So, so that's really good. I think that shows how they are keen to, to you know, help us get to something that works. Um, we will require you, if you wish to partake, to fill in a diary style sheet. Um, it will be slightly more complicated than the one I've shown before because we need some more details specifically on, on some of the behaviour of the fuel, um, but those will be shared with, with the people who are taking part. Um, the e will be distributed to the participants chosen location, so it, it's not like you need to, to turn up or arrange collection, it will be delivered to you and it can be tested in your own home environment 
um, on a trial route as you see fit. So, so stress test it. Obviously, I need to know how you've stress tested it, but, but feel free to, to, to work it in the way you would have worked coal. And that feedback will obviously need to come to me via the coal trials email shown at the bottom there. Okay, next slide then. So as we say, we do need you. And if you're willing to help in the e-coal development, then, then please email me at the, the coal trials address shown and, and let me know um, who you are, your engine, and, and um, your rough location would be, be helpful. I will then get into communication with, with the people that we, we um, select from the cross-section that, that Dave mentioned earlier, because uh, that's really important that we get a fair cross-section. Um, and also, pl please do also keep in mind that we, we need to um, get these trials rolling quite soon. So if you're wintered up and, and not looking to be in ticket for, for several months or, or you're pending work or you're on holiday, et cetera, um, please consider whether you whether you really can sort of support at this time or not. Um, but 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 don't don't hold back. Otherwise, you know it, we really do need uh, your engagement. As has been said several times, this is open to everyone. So full size miniatures, any engine type, member or non-member, it really doesn't matter. Um, this is important that we get this data available for everyone. Okay, next slide then. So that, that, that was the conclusion to our developmental stage, and I would say really early days. The next stage is proposed for the future, and I'm referring to this as more scientific. Um, this is the back-to-back -back trials. So once we've gathered your feedback from those diary sheets and also from the e-coal trials, we will hopefully have a clear picture on the fuels that are looking promising in our applications. The purpose of doing back-to-back -back trials then is to try and remove some of the variables between um, different engine types, different road conditions, perhaps if you're out on the road, weather conditions, et cetera, um, and, and even perhaps driver behaviours, you know, responses, et cetera. So we are, we are currently looking at ways that we can develop as best as possible a steady state test for road steam application. Now that is, that is really hard. I, I do this so well. I used to do it professionally for petrol engines. It's much easier because you can put them in a, in a dyno test. Um, and you can limit all these things for, for road steam. Obviously, it's so diverse um, that, that that is going to involve a few bits of, of measuring rather than just limiting or controlling these factors. But, but that is what we are aiming for. And as I say, it's still in development. The idea then is that we test the broadest range of fuels across the biggest range of road steam applications as possible to give the fairest representation and a very controlled and measured way of comparing fuel X to fuel Y, et cetera, um, as, as we go forward. When the time comes to do that, we will again be inviting participants to take part in that activity. Obviously, we will share what that activity looks like, and you can decide if you wish to be part of it. Um, as, as with all of these things, the purpose of doing this is so the data can be shared with everyone to help make informed choices. Um, the reason why this will take a bit longer to develop, and it's right that we do this in a controlled manner, is it is more difficult to do, and it is going to be costly. It will be costly for the trust to undertake. So it must be must be done well, and it must be done for the benefit of, of everyone. There's no point doing it too early, and it being a waste of time and money. Um, we need to time it right, that we gather meaningful data and share that at a time that's right. In terms of my timeline, I would like to think that will be completed by the end of this year, but obviously, I, I reserve the right to review that based on how the diary sheet information comes back. Um, okay, next slide. So that there's lots to conclude and I could talk for hours and, and I'm already getting a bit tired of, of my own voice, so I will try and wrap this up quickly. But I think it's important just to reflect on the fact that the landscape of, of our readily available coals has changed quite rapidly and in a short space of time. Personally, I didn't foresee that it was going to be quite this volatile as quickly as it has been. Um, and sadly, I think that is something we're going to have to get used to in, in 2022 is the uncertainty around what fuel might be available, particularly when it comes to going to events where you know, our standard choices may no, may no longer be there for, for various reasons. As I say at the bottom, a lot of people will find that their regular go-to coal will disappear in the coming weeks, months and years. And if not already, certainly the case for me. Um, so I'm in the same boat. OK, next slide. Okay, so the purpose of these activities, as I've, as I've tried to label, and I will say one more time, is to help us all make informed choices around what is available now, so specifically this year, and what will be available in the coming years. This is all about providing information relevant to road steam, so that, that's, that's critical as well. There's been a lot of work done on the railways, but as I say, we, we recognise their application is diff different to ours. 
And the idea of this is to help you make decisions on what will work best for you. It won't be me or the NTET telling you, we, t- we think this fuel is the one for you. It is your choice. It's purely providing that data to help everyone make that decision. Okay, and the final slide. So my closing message, just to try and pick, pick it up a bit, because it all seems a bit doom and gloom, is we do need to see 2022 as being an experimental year in terms of the fuels that will be available to us or issued at, at events. I guess my plea is, is not to see that as, as negative and, and mourning the loss of, of perhaps fuels that we wish were still available or were going to be available long term, but more consider it as an opportunity to share that information with everyone via the diary sheets and the other activities we're going to take out. And we can all learn from that and, and hopefully provide that information to the manufacturers in the case of the, uh, the e-coal products to help improve those in the future. In my mind, this is going to be critical for helping us as individuals make our cho- choices on which fuels to use and also event organisers who are starting, well, who more than starting, are feeling the, the pinch of, of the uh, demise of some of the coal sources that we were used to. So, so please try to take the positive from this. The more you engage and help, the better the, better this will be it's the only way it can be as far as i can see and if you have any suggestions or ideas please email me i'm open i'm open to them okay i think that concludes it from me and that that feels really long so i'll hand back to dave tom thank you very much indeed um (laughs) a lot of work there it's been a pleasure working with you and uh, you're most welcome to have joined us i'm grateful that you chose to join us and, and we use your experience and expertise um and i hope people although Uh, There's been a lot to take in. We'll join in with us. Um, It is the National Traction Engine Trust uh, moving this forward, but for the benefit of everybody. We want to be the conduit. We want to be consistent results that we can then be confident of will work for, for the future. So thank you, Tom. I'm going to move on to my concluding slide for this session. I hope I am, which is there. Um, all through this conversation, I'm sure there, there, are, there are questions going through people's minds, uh, and you might think that we've not touched on every facet. Um, that, that would be true. We could be here for the rest of the day. And what we have produced, uh, with the help of CPL, I have to say, who have supplied us with lots of information that you've seen today, uh, particularly from my presentation, um, we have got a, uh, a question and answer sheet. Um, there are 10 questions with loads of answers. And my original thought was to put them onto slides. Well, we'd take the rest of the afternoon because the answers are quite detailed that have been supplied. So we're going to put that uh, Q&A document onto the website uh, later today, I hope, and it will be found under the owners and drivers tab on the NTT website. Question and answers about coal. So I think uh, that concludes my session uh, Bob, I'm going to hand back to you. Uh, incidentally, if you anything else that you wish uh, from me, uh, email to tsu at ntet.co.uk. I'll be pleased to uh, join in your correspondence. Thanks, Bob. Good. Thank you, David. Thank you, Tom. That was very good. Um, hope we can get a number of people willing to do the trials and move forward from there. The next thing I'm going to talk about is boiler inspections, and it's a reminder. We've had one or two questions recently about boiler inspections and so on, and I thought it opportune to remind people what is required. (coughs) And you can see what the law says is that the pressure system safety regulations require a written scheme of examination to be created for a pressure system. That's the first item. And the scope of it is the written. I've jumped a slide. The written scheme has got to be drawn up by a competent person. And as I said, we were having one or two technical difficulties this morning. Uh, Go back to that. The written scheme should be drawn up by a competent person. But more importantly, 
it is the duty of the owner to ensure that the scheme has been drawn up and that it sensibly applies to the system that it refers to. So moving on to the scope of the written scheme, and the written scheme must cover all the pressure vessel, all parts, and those parts, pipelines and pipework, which if they fail may give rise to danger and all protective devices. The written scheme must also specify the nature and frequency of examinations and include any special measures that may be needed to prepare a system for a safe examination. For pressure systems, such as steam boilers, the written scheme should prescribe the examination of the system when it is cold and stripped down and when it is running under normal conditions. There must be provision for clearly recording the results of each examination, including the outcome and any defects found and repairs that should be undertaken. The two components, cold and hot, combined to form the thorough examination. A separate description is required for undertaking a hydraulic test of the system. So applying that written scheme, the examination undertaken in accordance with the written scheme of examination is a statutory examination that is designed to ensure that your pressure system is safe and fit for purpose. It is not a substitute for regular and routine maintenance. The pressure system must be examined in accordance with the written scheme by a competent person. The owner must comply with the requirements to prepare the system for examination. The competent person must conclude their examination by preparing a report of the findings and include any conditions that prevent the system from being returned to service or to operate at its normal pressure. Now we come on to the competent person. It is the owner who has the legal responsibility to ensure themselves that the competent person has the necessary knowledge, experience and equipment to undertake the functions required of them. The competent person is required to demonstrate to the owner their competency by way of qualifications and or demonstrating sufficient knowledge and experience of the system under examination. The competent person's responsibility. The competent person undertaking an examination of the pressure system in accordance with the written scheme of examination takes the responsibility for all aspects of the examination. On systems where ancill ancillary examination, we've lost a bit. On systems where ancillary examination techniques such as non-destructive testing are undertaken, the competent person must assume responsibility for the results of these tests and their, interpret and their interpretation, even though the tests may have been carried out by someone else. So that summarizes, I hope, the responsibilities, particularly of the owner. I believe in the past that a number maybe me as well, have thought that it's the competent person who is the responsible person. It isn't. It is the owner, his responsibility to appoint a competent person. And the person, if there is a fault, if there is a, a, an incident, the first person to be responsible will be the owner. I hope that makes it clear on the owner's responsibilities. I've no doubt there will be some questions or comments about that, but if you put them in the chat or the questions and answer, we'll try and answer them later. 
or if we can't answer them during this morning, we will certainly publish the answers. So that was uh, the pressure systems and the written scheme of ex boiler inspections. And now we're going back to go back to David, who's going to update us on insurance. David. Well, I hope I am, Bob. <laughs> I'm coming back now. Okay, I'm back on board. Um, I'll be very brief here. Uh, there's not an awful lot to say about insurance per se. Um, Walker Midgley continues to participate in our DISC scheme, although things have been fairly quiet. And Louise Maunder, uh, I don't know if Louise is listening to this. Uh, a debt of gratitude we owe Louise because she has been actually generating the discs on behalf of Walker Midgley because they've been working external to their offices since the pandemic and have decided they're not going back to their office. And it's that decision that has propelled us into the, the next part of my uh, uh, narrative, if you like. But Louise has been uh, receiving information from Walker Midgley and producing discs on their behalf to their instruction. And we've been very, very grateful for her to do that. So moving on, I hope. Moving on, definitely. Yes, there we go. That's better. <clears throat> we've um, we've had to generate very quickly um, a new system, which allows people to access the disk management system from their front room, or their kitchen, or their attic, wherever they're working. Would you believe? <clears throat> so we've we've arrived at a centralised online system. That's that big box you can see in the middle of the screen with the fancy cloud. And the idea is that the inspector and the owner furnish, as ever, the data to their uh, disc issuing agent, Walker Midgley, one broker, uh, and to James Campbell, uh, to Tol uh, Tolgate, as it is now. Uh, those details still go there. But now uh, the agents will enter the data that they're receiving onto a centralized data system. Um, it's accessible by all of the insurance brokers that are authorized to issue discs. But although it's a centralized system, what is important for commercial reasons and security reasons, they, any particular broker can only ever see the information that they themselves have entered. And the information that is in there in the system that is peculiar to the uh, agent is the address of the owner of the engine, the details, the details of the engine itself, <clears throat> and the uh, the data that gets onto the disc. All of that is peculiar and specific to the to the particular broker. Uh, there is common data. The list of inspectors is common, and it is managed from the centre by Ian Cooper and possibly Louise as well, who may continue to work alongside him. So there's a centralized process there. And what's important to understand about the uh, inspectors, the boiler inspectors, we some long time ago introduced the concept that although the NTT has no direct control over inspectors and neither does it want that direct control, it wants to be sure, it wants to be sure that there is sufficient um, security uh, should things not go right. So there is an insistence that all insurance, uh, all in boiler inspectors who participate in this scheme must provide proof of current professional indemnity insurance. And this insurance has got to have an enduring capability. A decision made today might have a show of a bad effect in some time in the future. So they must have a professional liability insurance and it has to be enduring. Most of it is. Now, why am I laboring this point? Although it isn't mentioned on the screen, the system knows what the uh, insurance details are of that professional insurance, professional indemnity insurance it knows when that insurance expires. And what will happen in the new system is that 
a few weeks before the expiry date, the system will automatically generate an email and send that email to the boiler inspector saying, look up sunshine, your PI insurance is expiring. Assuming of course, that their own broker has sent them the same information. Now here's the rub. If the insurance is not reported as renewed before the expiry date, then there will be no discs issued by the system until that insurance is moved on to a new expiry date. There is no latitude. And why would there be? <clears throat> because what, what we want to ensure is that at the time of the inspection, insurance was in place. So, and the system is going to be fairly severe about that, I have to tell you. It won't affect you particularly as owners, but it will affect your boiler inspector who may not be able to get a disc out for you. He may have carried out the inspection, but we will not issue a disc unless we know that he's actually insured. Simples. Another significant change is that we've, <clears throat> we have had to move away from the good old um, disc carrier, which was a plain piece of paper, the shape of a compliment slip with the disc pre-printed on, on it, um, and that disc would then be offered to another printer that filled in the details that you see on the screen. Um, for all sorts of technical reasons, that process now won't work, particularly with people who are working away from the central office. They've got no central, they've got no printing facilities. So we've changed the format of the carrier to an A4 sheet of paper, and the disc sits at the bottom right-hand corner of that sheet of paper, and gets printed and it, it starts life as a pdf file the pdf file will get printed or it'll get attached to an email and sent to the owner as a pdf file uh, if he goes as, as it goes as a pdf to the owner then the owner would be requested to print the disc themselves and affix it to their engine in the normal way you have an option when you join the scheme to say whether you want a disc by email or whether you want the disc by snail mail. It's very simple. Uh, and, and the options are there. <clears throat> and that's the point there. It allows printing by the broker or dispatch by email. Now, I can imagine that one or two people are wrinkling their noses. Crikey, that means I could print the disc. Anybody can print a disc. That is quite true. I can't deny that. But this is the, where we are today. Uh, this is the quickest way we can get the disc through the system and out. It's quicker than before. Uh, and if we've got to change it, we will think about changing it, but we want to give this process a trial uh, and it, it, it'll be online and available in the very, very near future now. Just get that. The other side of the disc scheme, we generally think of having a disc and sticking it on the engine and that's all right. And the, and the rally organizers safety office comes around and says, where's your disc sunshine? Um, well, <clears throat> for a long while now running, there's been um, a, a process where the event organizer, particularly if they're an authorized event, uh, they can jump on board the online system uh, and they can dial in the registration number of your engine or the identity of your miniature or or your uh, stationary engine, and they can say, they can see that uh, for the time, for the duration of their rally, uh, whether there would be an insurance disc. And um, from that point of view, then they would go down, I'm, I'm suggesting they'd have a copy of the proposed program and go down the engine list and go onto this system and they put a tick or a cross against um, what they're reading. And then they would only need to visit those engines where they've got crosses to see if in between times when the rally is running, uh, it has been uh, uh, had a new disc issue. They can even look on the day of the rally and find out. So it's th this process is designed to help the authorised rally safety officer. And just as a final point, um, that's a spoof one, but, but you, the layout of the disc is absolutely no different whatsoever to what it was before. It's only the piece of paper that carries it that has actually changed. So 
that's the end of insurance as I am at the moment. Uh, I will say that as ever, if you've got any questions that you want me to answer specifically, please write to me at tsu at ntt.co.uk. Thank you for listening. Thank you, David. Um, we now move on to our president and our representative on best, Andrew Semple. Andrew, are you with us? I hope so, Chairman. I'm just clicking vaguely on boxes to make it all come to life. Ah, there we are. I think uh, you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Nick, you've got to switch me on. You're already on, Andrew. We can see you. Oh, that's a shame. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, before I get on to best, I want to share something with you, which is not actually on the agenda uh, and will come as quite a surprise to everybody except our chairman, Rob Wing, who uh, was party to the first discussion on this. But I was thinking the other day about, as some of you may know, I, I commentate occasionally at rallies. And one of the things we're very much aware of is the fact, as David often says, we can be accused of polluting for fun. And what can we say in our defence, being practical about the situation as it is now? And so I got to thinking about what items I might discuss if I was sitting behind the microphone. And the first point I wanted to make um, was that our contribution to the CO2 produced by the United Kingdom is one quarter of 1% of the total UK output. So it's a pretty minuscule amount. Now, I then went on to think about how much CO2 a tonne of coal can produce when burnt. And there are various figures. You can look on Google and things like that. And the maximum seems to be about two and a half tonne. But anyway, if you said three tonnes CO2 equivalent to be on the safe side, and by comparison, a jumbo jet crossing the Atlantic creates 500 tonnes equivalent. So it helps to illustrate what a relatively small amount that we produce. Oh, and by the way, there's over a thousand flights every 24 hours across the Atlantic from Europe to the States. So um, as I say, when you look at the bigger picture, we're, we're very much a small part of it. In our defence, we're also working, as you've heard in great detail, about developments in e-coal, and that's very much a moving target as to what will come out of that. Uh, and also, heritage owners, particularly uh, in other areas, 35% of them are already participating in carbon offsetting. So, Rob and I started thinking we would try and develop this into some sort of information leaflet, which would be useful for engine owners to present in their defence uh, and also not so much in their defence but to assure younger people who are very concerned about the environment and rightly so that in fact as, as they stand there looking at an engine it, it, its contribution to atmospheric pollution is really almost so small it's unmeasurable. Um, and we felt that this sort of information should be put in the public domain. This will, thought will come as a surprise to everybody involved, uh, David and, and Tom in particular. Um, but I, I just thought it was worth sharing because I was going to bring it to the... We have a general council meeting in two weeks' time when uh, we will be, for the first time for a long, long time, actually be meeting face to face. Um, and I was going to throw it on the table there with a view to trying to get something produced in time for the rally season. Um, so that should you get some eco warrior coming up to you and saying, you know, oh, yeah, 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 this, that, the other, um, you can at least provide them with a few facts and figures, um, which will illustrate that we're really not as bad as they would like to think we are and how we're working to make ourselves even better. So that's just an aside, um, and more of that another day. BEST. Um, I've been involved with BEST since the very beginning almost, when uh, 
about four of us used to meet in the drafty room in the college in Keighley. And uh, those days we were planning to start a, a boiler shop uh, and train people and so on. Anyway, uh, the man who was going to provide the money in the end didn't. So Best took a completely different form. And it has been very successful in uh, running some courses for uh, boiler making in particular, which we got funded by the Heritage Lottery. And I've followed a lot of the trainees that we had on that course, and they've continued to work in the industry. So it was a, a very much uh, worthwhile uh, event uh, and activity to do that sort of training. So anyway, the trust is better represented than ever in BEST uh, in that I've been joined by Colin Hatch, who will now be, who I'm sure is familiar to a lot of members. Um, Colin brings a great deal of engineering knowledge and skill to uh, the BEST board and has been very much involved in some more recent practical developments. One of the things that uh, we're doing uh, and this is very much favoured by the railways. They've discovered that they get volunteers who arrive in their workshop um, and they have no basic knowledge of engineering work. It, as simple as how to use a hammer properly, a hacksaw, how to hold a chisel and so on. So we are working what is going to be recognised uh, as a basic course, which I know um, John Reddyhoff at the Keithley and Worth Valley um, already has a, a, a similar setup for when they get people arriving so that they can actually establish what level of skills they have. Looking at more interesting things for engine owners, we're looking at courses for retubing boilers, uh, redoing boiler stays and fitting patch screws and so on. Uh, these will involve a lot of uh, online teaching uh, and instructional films, which again, Colin uh, is working very hard to develop. Um, and another one that I think will be particularly interesting in the future is an understanding of bearings and bearing lubrication. And I know one that he's actively working on at the moment uh, will be remetalling of a white metal bearing. Uh, and Colin will be leading this activity uh, in his workshop as and when the course becomes available. All of these courses, of course, we're trying to plan to be as economical as possible because uh, as far as the road steam is concerned, we're really looking basically at individuals who will want to participate. It's, it's fine for railways who have an established workshop and possibly paid employees and, and a training budget and so on and so on. Um, but when we look at the road steam side of it, um, it's my job really sitting in the best board to say, oh, hang on a minute. It's all very well, you boys having these wonderful uh, plans about weak residential courses and all the rest of it. Um, but my chaps can't afford that, but they want the knowledge. So we are working uh, on those sort of ideas where we can do quite a lot of online learning, which we've all become quite accustomed to in the last couple of years. But we're continuing to work closely with the railways on uh, other aspects as well, which provides funding for BEST. We have got into this dreaded competency activity where railways are now required to develop their safety management systems and they have to have competent people doing it. So a lot of the uh, well-qualified members of BEST, uh, chartered engineers and so on, have been establishing competency levels nationally, which enables us to then um, offer courses and certify that people are capable of doing what they require. Um, that, that's unlikely to touch very much on, on what we want to do in road steam. But in conclusion, I would say that we'd welcome input from anybody who has an interest. And as I say, whilst being mindful that best work tends to be railway or orientated, we welcome input from any area of the STEAM fraternity with ideas and requirements and suggestions. 
and you can find us uh, on the best website uh, or indeed, of course, through Colin and myself. Um, a lot of people uh, do get in touch with me directly and you're very welcome to do so. So, so have a look at the best website. Uh, that will enlarge on what we're doing. Uh, and if we can help in any way, then feel free to get in touch with us. So that's it really from me. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Andrew. That's very good. We'll now move on to the Steam Apprentice Club. Nick, you're on. Ah, thank you, Bob. Um, well, uh, good morning from the Steam Apprentice Club. Uh, I'll start by uh, mentioning driving days. Uh, Last year, with many rallies and uh, engines out, many rallies cancelled and engines out of ticket, it again meant that we could only run one driving day last year, which was at Tinkers Park in Sussex uh, in September. But this year, we've got a nearly full programme of driving days planned, and the applications are rolling in. We're also in touch with some new organisations in the hope of adding some more events to the list. So, can you run a driving day? Uh, hold on, let's get to the next slide. Yeah. We're extremely grateful to those who can run driving days on behalf of the SAC, but we're keen to add more events to the calendar. So if you're part of a group, an organisation or a rally and can get several full size or miniature engines together for a private day, we'd be interested to hear from you. A driving day is basically a day of having a steam up while showing the younger generation of how everything is done. It's our duty to ensure that the days go ahead in a safe manner, and we appreciate that thinking about risk assessments and insurance and requirements can be quite off-putting. But in reality, it's all just common sense stuff and probably easier than you're expecting. And I'm happy to discuss what goes into organising driving days with anyone who is interested. Another question we get is... Uh, do, drive, do the engine men involved with driving days require a DBS check? Uh, and the answer is no, not for, uh, for just a one-off event. You don't require a DBS check for that because it's deemed that there's not enough time for, uh, involved to form a relationship with the, uh, with the apprentice. And in most cases, the, uh, the parent is still in the vicinity anyway. So if you are... Uh, interested in organising a driving day, please do get in touch. Uh, my email is sac.chairman at ntt.co.uk. Looking further afield, uh, we've recently been in touch with representatives of a STEAM club in Australia who are hoping to set up a similar club for young people over there. Uh, I'll be continuing the conversations with them to assist in whatever way we can and uh, hopefully we'll have uh, a partner club down under soon. Uh, Raising Steam magazine. Uh, as always, I must repeat uh, our usual plea for articles for Raising Steam. In, uh, in January, we published the annual bumper edition from Raising Steam, and I believe this has currently exhausted the editor's supply of articles. So. If you have anything that you're in, you'd be able to write, uh, please do send it to sac.raisingsteam at ntt.co.uk. Uh, articles don't just have to come from apprentices. Uh, they can come from owners, parents, engine men, and they can be from just a few words and a couple of photos to a day, about a day out on your engine or even up to a more technical article about maintenance work. We'll, uh, we'll welcome anything you want to provide. Apprentice Club Awards. Uh, each year the SAC has two annual awards. We've got the Technical Achievement Award and the Apprentice of the Year Award. The Apprentice of the Year is an award to recognise uh, an apprentice who has shown all round enthusiasm uh, in their involvement in road steam, either as hands-on experience with an engine or helping to maintain or restore an engine. Consideration should be given to how they've learned and used the necessary skills needed in the operation of the engine. An ideal candidate is an apprentice who has made an effort, shown willingness to learn, and has shown great enthusiasm for our hobby. Uh, 
if you'd like to make a submission for for an apprentice of the year, then that could consist of a brief brief description of what they've been doing for the year and why you think the apprentice deserves the award, and maybe a few photos to accompany it. The Technical Achievement Award uh, is for an apprentice who has been involved in the more technical side of a hobby, such as the restoration of an engine, building of a miniature, or any kind of engineering work related to road steam. The aim is to encourage our members to develop hands-on skills and nominations for this award can be, come from a sponsor or from the apprentice themselves. At the AGM last November, uh, we gave this award to Tim Morris for his work on his family's McLaren Road Loco uh, and also work in building a six inch chain drive uh, tasker. Uh, any nominations for these awards can come to uh, come to me at sac.chairman at ntt.co.uk. So uh, a bit about the SAC committee. Uh, the SAC is run by a small group of volunteers and we would welcome assistance from anyone else who would like to get involved, particularly running of our share of marquee at the Great Dorset Steam Fair. There are currently several roles on the SAC committee that are vacant, so please do get in touch if you're, uh, if you're able to help. Over the past few years, during the COVID outbreak and uh, of lockdowns, we have seen a reduction in the number of members of the SAC, um, which we've basically tripped yeah, to the lack of events and, and COVID uh, not allowing us to do anything. But now that we're looking into a more normal year in 2022, we're hoping that the membership numbers will increase again. And if you do know of any apprentices who might have uh, let their membership lapse, please do get in touch with them and, and give them a reminder to rejoin. Uh, I think that's everything from me at the SAC, so uh, if you have any questions, please do get in touch. But uh, I think over to our Chairman Rob Wing now. Thanks, Nick. We'll now move on to Rob. Uh, and then after Rob, I'll uh, just say a few words to finish it off. So Rob, are you there? I certainly am, Bob. Thank you. And thank you uh, very much for hosting this, uh, this webinar. I'm sure that all members will feel that uh, there's an awful lot going on behind the scenes. And it's probably that that I'd like to focus on a bit, because um, if any of you have read my my last missive in Steaming Magazine, you'll notice that um, it started with the word only four magazines a year. And, and the reason I mention this is, and I don't want to labour it, it's just that some people have said, well, the NTET, it's really only four magazines a year. and I, I trust that you'll concur and agree with me that the work that's been done by the TSU team and new edition Tom, really good Tom, love to have you with us, um, has been really um, proactive in trying to help the movement and our members in understanding just what's going on with coal. And that costs time and it costs money. So you know, maybe that's the value of four or five magazines before we start. Then we've got um, an unintended consequence of COVID enter this system scheme falls to pieces because the insurance companies change their habit of working. David and his team have reacted, you know, PDQ, and they have developed a different system that allows us as members to be able to have our NTET disc on our engines as before. And that's very easy to say, but actually when you're delivering it, it's really a huge amount of work. So once again, my thanks go to the TSU team who really are standing on and delivering in the face of you know, real trouble time. So thank you very much to, on behalf of our members, to you guys. I suppose the, the subscription thing has to be mentioned. Um, it's been very controversial, but it's, it's my job along with the, the trustees and the general counsel to ensure that, that the trust is fit for purpose. And, and quite clearly um, not having um, an increase in subs in the last 12 years, has caused a severe hardship and it's very difficult and it's very uneasy uneasy to have to rep to uh, represent to you that we need an increase in membership i hope that you're just hearing a glimmer as to, as to what you buy when you uh, deliver your membership through to us and to make that process easier we're introducing a direct debit system 
all of our trustees are volunteers and we've got Richard Temple, who's our uh, membership secretary, and he needs his job to be made easier. And by doing this, we've introduced a direct, dif- a direct debit system and it will be coming very soon. That just makes us our, our life so much more simple. And we hope that it'll make yours easier in, in renewing. And on top of that, we've worked very hard to ensure that as far as HMRC is concerned, we qualify for gift aid. Now, that's not going to cost you, as dear old Harold Wilson said, the pound in your pocket. It's actually going to cost HMRC the pound in their pocket. Because if you are a UK taxpayer, then you qualify for gift aid. And if you be kind enough to fill in that part of the form, then your trust can receive 25% of the membership back from HMRC and without it costing you anything else. So please, can I commend to you to consider using the gift aid uh, option in your uh, subscription renewal? I appreciate some of us uh, maybe are not uh, paying UK tax, but if you are, please, if you could do that, I'd be really grateful. Watch out for our webinars that are coming up. Um, This is getting to a busy time of the year, but we have got a couple coming up in the future. Not least of all, we've got the uh, rally authorization event that Charlie will be hosting in the near near future. And uh, our General Secretary, Naomi, and I will be uh, putting together one or two more uh, webinars before we actually move into the the season. Our trajectory. we're on the way up and isn't that exciting and it's all down to to our members and to the trustees who are, are working tirelessly behind the scenes to make our trust as relevant as we can be to the movement in in, in in road steam and my gosh don't we need that support at the moment because it seems to be coming in from everywhere but we're on it and we are here to support our members and the wider steam movement in any way possible so please I know this is a drum that I'm always banging. If you know somebody that isn't a member of the trust, would you just have a word with them and see if they would reconsider or maybe they haven't thought about it? Because we are accruing members now for the first time in, in, in a couple of years and our membership is increasing. And one hopes that that is in recognition of what my fellow trustees are doing to support the movement. Gosh, this drum's getting a really good bang, isn't it? But um, we do produce four magazines a year to our members but i really really hope that this short oration has has beyond all reasonable doubt demonstrated that we are so much more than just those magazines even though we all enjoy them so bob i'm going to pa- pass back to you but just thank you to all the uh, attendees and also our panelists who have been on the uh, the screen this morning listening and participating thank you bob Thank you, Rob. Um, Question and answer session we had. We had one or two questions posed to us before this, uh, before the day. Um, We've got um, a couple of answers there. One, if we haven't got the answer already, we will get it and we will publish it. We haven't got an answer to the first one yet. Um, but the second one, you can see the answer uh, from Tom. Um, we, we can only carry on with the coal trials. So finally, I think it, to wind it, it up, I'd like to make a plea, first of all, uh, for some more articles for steaming. Um, We need those because it's your magazine and we'd love to hear about what you've been doing. Um, You've had two years of thinking about things, so please write it up. In the meantime, we are trying to republish some of the technical tips from uh, steaming that go back to the 90s which are still relevant today, but we could do with more. There's no doubt that uh, in your work on your engines, you found things that, well, you say, well, who'd have thought of that? That something that has occurred or you found something on the engine, some wear or some odd thing, 
write it up for us. There's no need to put your, we no need to publish your name if you don't want it. But the whole object of the exercise of technical tips is to pass on the knowledge to the next generation. It's no good saying, oh, well, I'm not going to tell anybody about that because it, it's, I've made a mistake and I don't want people to laugh at me. Well, that's not the object of the exercise. If you've made a mistake and found something that potentially was embarrassing, but is important for other people to know, let us know. You've no need to put your name to it. We'll publish it anonymously, but it is important that we get this information out to everybody. So that's a request for technical tips and articles for steaming. And finally, thank you to all who've contributed this morning and also to those who've been listening. I think we've had something like 63 people online. Hopefully we'll, we'll get back to face-to-face -face meeting next year when Cathy Smith will be delighted to be able to sell you books in person. But in the meantime, can you, access, you can access the shop and purchase things from there. And finally, the last final thing, a special thanks to our General Secretary, Naomi, who has done an excellent job in organising this webinar and producing the slides. Thank you very much again. We will publish the, the uh, content of the webinar as soon as we can edit it, and it will be published probably in Steaming and on the website. Thank you very much. Do you want to come in, Rob? Oh, no, 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 not particularly, Bob, but just once again to, on behalf of the National Tracks and Engine Trust, thank you to those uh, who have joined us and thank you to the panellists. And I hope you've enjoyed the morning. Thank you, everybody. And hopefully get some good steaming this year. Thank you.